Uh, welcome everyone. It's my name's Billy Giles Courtai. I'm the Urban Futures Enabling Capability Platform Director at MIT University, and I'm delighted to welcome you today to uh, our distinguished lecture series. Um, today being presented by distinguished professor Xing Yu. Um, this is forms part of a series of lectures that we're putting on through the Distinguished Professor Program, and uh, I do encourage you to look out for further advertisements of what's coming up. Um, before starting, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands of which we're all meeting, wherever you are across Australia or across the state. The Wur in, in Melbourne, the Wurrung and the Bunurong language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nations on whose unceded land uh, with the university conducts its business. I respectfully acknowledge the ancestors and elders past and present, and I would like to acknowledge the traditional traditional custodians uh, of the lands and ancestors of the lands of the waters across Australia, where we conduct our business as a university. Before starting, I just want to have to do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, for those of you who would like to ask a question, uh, when we get started, there's a Q&A session down the bottom on your the band down the bottom of your um, screen. Um, please choose the um, little icon which has got the question mark in it, and that's the Q&A session. So post all of your questions into that, that um, and we look forward to having a session of question and answers, answer session at the end. We'll have about 10 or 15 minutes for that. So without further ado, um, it's my uh, great honor and pleasure to today uh, uh, introduce our distinguished professor for today's lecture. Uh, distinguished Professor Jing Yu uh, is an Associate Deputy Vice Chancellor at RMIT University and he's the Chair of RMIT, the RMIT Pro Professorial Academy. His main research interests include control systems, intelligent and complex systems and energy systems. And he's been received many awards and honours for his contribution to his field uh, over the years. This includes the 2018 MA Sergeant Medal from Engineers Australia, the 2018 Australian um, L Distinguished Professor contribution from the Australian AI, sorry, um, Distinguished Research contribution from the Australian Computer Society. In 2013, the Dr. Ng Eugene Mittelman Achievement Award from the IEEE Industrial Electronics Society. And importantly too, um, with a H index of 70, according to Web of Science, with nearly 19,000 uh, citations. For many years now, since 2015, Jing has been uh, named as a highly cited research by Clarivet Analytics, which is was formerly known as Thomson's Reuter. He's a fellow of the IEEE Engineers Australia, the Australian Computer Society, and also the Australian Institute of Company Directors. So it's with great pleasure that I welcome him today to give his distinguished professor's lecture on engineering cyber physical systems and nature inspired simplicity approach. So over to you, Xing. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to give uh, uh, this lecture. So lecture is actually entitled the engineering cyber physical system. This is a uh, cyber physical system has been a buzzword uh, over the last uh, uh, quite a few years. Uh, you know, uh, everybody is talking about it. What I'm going to do today is uh, basically trying to share with you some of the uh, experience of dealing with uh, cyber physical system and uh, uh, give some kind of a brief introductions. Uh, uh, one particular purpose of the talk is uh, basically to show the potential. So means whether there is uh, uh, in the future we can collaborate uh, uh, in these areas, uh, not just simply uh, within the science and engineering, but uh, with social science and the business, and even more than uh, and uh, beyond that. So, uh, cyber physical system is uh, just by term uh, is uh, basically cyber physical system, the integration of cyber system and physical system. So this is actually, uh, uh, and everybody, uh, regardless uh, you are scientist, engineer, or um, you know, a social scientist, will have something to do with it, right? The internet is basically is the thing uh, bring us so much change to our societies, to our own lives. And it's the same thing, right? The internet bring the changes 
to how the physical system is run, you know, to make it much more efficient, uh, cost effective, and much more uh, 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 environment friendly and uh, social responsible. So uh, I, I just want to show some of the examples, the systems actually are, have been working with uh, just to show the complexity, uh, how complex they are. The one we've been uh, working on, most of them is uh, industrial system. So here is uh, one of the typical example of the sugar uh, production process. You can see that it starts from the field and uh, when it's uh, mature, then you harvest and it coming to the uh, sugar mill and the sugar was produced and the shipping overseas and they uh, arrive on our, on our table. So this is the whole process. But if you look at the, the whole, uh, you know, the supply chain, it's much more complex. Actually, when they come into the sugar mill, it's actually going through uh, a, a lot of process, a chemical process. Uh, they shred into pieces, extract the juice, we call the uh, molasses, and then you put the chemicals, so you crystallize the sugar, you extract it, and then, you, you, and then we got a sugar. And the byproducts will become fertilizer or become a fuel to, to generate electricity. So um, just imagine, right, if we, uh, and these days the sensor are very cheap now, if we are able to install the sensor everywhere on the system, we basically know how the system operates. The challenge is that, uh, you know, how to make it, uh, the whole production uh, much more efficient, uh, waste less, uh, cost less, and uh, and uh, produce more. So this is actually the challenge uh, uh, we have right now. In, in old time, we could not do that. Old time, I remember we started working in the top left part is uh, uh, scheduling uh, of the of the uh, uh, locals uh, to go to collect the sugar cans from the farmers. And we also did work in the middle. Uh, bottom up is the crystal, we call the crystallization process, which is actually control the, uh, uh, the chemicals and the control the production lines so that we have a consistency of sugar crystals. So those are, and now I think uh, this system can be made much more efficient. So another uh, sort of uh, uh, hobby topic is the smart grid. I've been doing that since I came to Australia. Uh, I'm sorry, since I came to RMIT, it's about uh, uh, just uh, less than 10, uh, 20 years ago. So this is another type of system. It's quite different from the one we talk about sugar production, uh, the supply chain. This one is different, is that you have different uh, physical system. You have a, a, a thermal plants, so nuclear plants, so microgrids, electrical vehicles, uh, wind farms, solar panel, everything combined together. You can consider this smart grid is actually forming this energy highway so, and then they coordinate uh, all the components uh, uh, working together to generate uh, the energy, uh, you know, to, to use less fuel, to make it much more efficient. Or in the future, I think we will uh, reduce or eliminate the use of thermal plants uh, and even nuclear plants. So one of the challenges of this type of system, which is different, I'm, I always use this chart, is that uh, this is the people uh, outside the electrical engineering uh, do not actually uh, very much and, and understand well in the way how this whole energy system. Energy system is very peculiar. If you consider, let's say, low yang power stations, and there's uh, you know another power stations in the Stanway in central Queensland. But what we we ha you, how do you operate the whole network? Is these two machines, two generators, uh, gen uh, plant has to be synchronized, means they rotate in the same speed. So this is very much like this uh, acrobat uh, uh, troop operation. You can see those two bikes uh, are the ge huge generators. The rest of the, the performance, you can consider they, they, are, they are either users or they are small generators or they are uh, sort of uh, some, somehow to do with the, like electrical vehicles. So this kind of a dynamic balance become critical. So this is actually one of the most difficult cyber physical system uh, we ever built. Uh, you know, the human ever built. So how to make it efficient, uh, and that's very important. So last night I watched the uh, Q&A and they are now talking about using gas, uh, you know, as alternative energy, intermittent energy source until we reach the fully renewables. But uh, when you have those and, and, and in the future we have fully renewable energy, you, 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 this is a stability issue become even more. So, so there's a lot of things to be done. 
So on, on the other hand, it's the social dimension. Even myself is not a social scientist. But if you look at this uh, physical layer, uh, physical, this connection of all these generators and, you know, solar panels, uh, you know, wind turbine, all together, there's actually another different kind of network, of network, a different kind of network on top of that. Apart from this information technology communication uh, network on top of that, you all also have these kind of companies. You know, for example, in supply side, you have different companies generate energy, and you have different companies to maintain the transmission tower and the distribution. And we have retailers like EGL or Origin. They sell us as consumers and energy. And in the future, and even now, is uh, if we have a, uh, you know, if you have a solar panel. Uh, on your on your on your roof, you are able. You may be able to sell your energy, so you become supply as well. So this is there's a, a economic uh, a complexity here, and there's a social dimension here as well. So uh, cyber physical, I mean, the, the the system we are talking about is really really complex. Complex is not necessarily just fully focused on the you know how to operate this uh, physical uh, world, uh, physical setting. They also to do with the other participants in the whole system. So here is some kind of uh, classification uh, sort of uh, topics uh, we 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 uh, we wrote uh, a few years ago. Uh, this paper was uh, uh, quite highly uh, sort of cited. So basically, one of the key things to maintain this type of physical system is the information communication technology, and also of course is the intelligence. You know, there's a couple of main issues: is that there's uh, uh, architecture issues. The architecture. I'm not talking about the buildings. I'm talking about the software architecture is actually building the whole communications and uh, computation and uh, interaction the, 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 uh, uh, systems. And we have communication technology as well. And we have a uh, modeling and cyber security and also how to deal with the intelligence, how to conquer, deal with data. But let me just pick a few things, the challenges. You know, for example, in architecture, the enormity of this whole cyber physical put lots of challenges. So, well, the particular thing is uh, what uh, we know that uh, the computer language, for example, C++ or Python or, or Java, uh, are not able to do is that uh, they, their design principle is uh, on the, I call it the uh, event-driven things. It means if you designed a sequence of event, it has to be occur in sequence. But if you look at the control system, like the power system, we are talking about the network, uh, you calculate the control remotely. If the control signal arrives late, it's useless. What you have to do is drop it and go to the next one. So, but the current computer architecture cannot do that. So there's there's a lot of new work needs to be done uh, in that area. Uh, communication is another thing, right? In the internet, we're using internet uh, quite open, but those control systems, they are they need a kind of a signal feedback millisecond or even faster. But you cannot drop the, any communication. So the current infrastructure of the telecommunication cannot be directly used to control the whole system because we always have, a, you know, the jams, you know, the, uh, you know, stuff up, uh, you know, uh, a drop, uh, you know, uh, drop, drop out. So those things are not allowed. How do you de develop a new generation of communication system to have this kind of a, a, a security of the, the transmission is uh, become critical. Modeling simulation is not an issue, right? Modeling simulation is basically trying using the data to make a sense of what's happening in the past and what it's going to do in the future. And given that uh, there's so much data and how to do it uh, uh, efficiently, very important. Cybersecurity is another, another one. So those things, uh, all these type of physical system uh, have or uh, continue uh, to pose a significant challenges to all the existing methodologies uh, uh, we, we, we are having or we learn from our uh, universities not university time so another trend this is the interesting part is uh, i hope we have some si uh, social scientists there is there's cry of uh, in the cyber physical system uh, research uh, um, mainly scientists engineer is a look uh, to the social science because the cyber physical system because they respond to uh, to uh, social uh, to the humans uh, to the users uh, to the societies so, so they have to know what happened there so what happened is right now the current study is uh, uh, usually is uh, for example in the uh, this uh, smart grid scenario so what we usually do is uh, uh, we do is we produce a questionnaire 
and we're trying to understand our customer, what's kind of their appetite, preference, attitude, right? And then we do a survey when we use that to guard, we design the whole physical system. But uh, we don't know, one thing we don't know is, uh, you know, we all know, I mean, from our uh, exp uh, personal experience, we would uh, know that uh, the preferences, the attitude, uh, uh, those things can change all time through the social changes. So how can we understand that? So, but on, on the other hand, uh, we know there's a lot of research in the social science aspects to understand how human behaves and uh, and how the political influence, the economic influence, influence the human society change. So I think there's a, a lot of work needs to be done when we have this uh, uh, two system, uh, uh, you know, coming together, we overcome the divide between them. So this is certainly something Okay, I think one of the things that I expect to occur is after maybe is uh, that uh, we'll, I have been talking to social scientists, probably in the future we'll uh, talk more, is to look at uh, whether we can bring the, uh, the knowledge of cyber physical system into the smart city, you know, and how do we design, helping design the smart city, the city to be a much more smarter and uh, environment friendly, uh, the, the energy efficient and the cost effective. Okay, so one of the challenges from what we said uh, is one of the key things is uh, I mentioned that the sensor becomes so cheap, uh, so you can install it very easily. You know exactly what happened uh, across the whole, you know, whole uh, uh, the system, whole network. But the problem is that uh, you collect so many, so much information. What are you going to do with it? There's the information. The size become very uh, uh, big and uh, very complex. So what are you going to do it? So um, one of the challenge is that I think if you look at the older methodology, I mean the science engineering methodology we learn from our, our undergraduate, for example, electrical engineering uh, things. So they all sort of focus on microscopic details. For example, in robotics, robotics I will look at the motor dimensions, you know, the dyna dynamics of two dimensions. I will look at the, uh, you know, interaction between motors. Uh, I look at all different aspects that I build a model, I study it. But if you thinking about there's hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of those kind of dynamics involved, what are you going to do with it? So nothing, uh, I mean, there's no actually effective way so far to dealing with this kind of large size. This has actually become a huge challenge. Another thing is uh, dealing with sub physical system, in particular those uh, dynamic balancing type of sub physical system. You, you do need efficiency and effectiveness. You need to get solution within a reasonable time. You know, if you can't get it, there's no use. So how do you do it uh, quickly uh, and effectively is, is a big challenge. So, you know, we'll talk about that. Somebody, somebody may say, OK, let's have some kind of a smart algorithm, right? Let's have some uh, AI, you know, those could helping us solving this uh, uh, large, uh, uh, huge size of data. But there's a theorem probably damped all our enthusiasm. There's a, we, we call it no free, uh, no free lunch theorem. So the no free lunch theorem basically say that the computational complexity was solving, uh, assuming you have algorithms, so solving a, a large scale problem cannot be reduced. It just cannot reduce, regardless of, of what, whatever algorithm you use. But somebody may dispute that. Somebody say, oh, OK, what about uh, uh, genetic algorithm, uh, evolutionary computation? But those algorithms are computational algorithms. Those algorithms give, give you the likelihood of getting closer to optimal solution quicker. But we will never guarantee that you will find the optimal solutions. So if you really want, you have a, a hundred percent uh, assured that uh, uh, you know that optimal solution can be found, the time cannot be re reduced, right? So this is actually one of the fundamental theory of the computational uh, uh, sort of uh, algorithms. And we heard a lot about AI, right? So what is it? So we want to look at whether AI or something else we can use to solve this kind of largeness, as a huge, uh, huge. Uh, data uh, sets and the complexity. So this is actually the current uh, sort of general understanding of AI. So AI is uh, fundamentally is when they start in 1950s, the purpose uh, and then in 1950s uh, 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 is AI term was coined is basically 
trying to create machines and algorithms which can just like human does and uh, you know can perceive can learn can reason and can act right so if you look at those aspects surrounding that so there are quite a few issues you know one issue is mach machine learning so how do you learn how do you use machine learning so there's a difference uh, i mean of, of course machine cannot be just like human it's just like aircraft you cannot i mean the early attempt of making aircraft is like uh, trying to make a bird which you have the swing to, to flip. You can't, there's no physical to do that. So the, of course, we humans, we come to ingenious method. We actually not uh, having a flipping wings. We actually have a fixed wings, but we use the, this kind of a jet to pushing the through using the aerodynamics pushes. So machine learning, machine things is different from humans, right? And there's also the research on cognitive science is very important. Understand our uh, sort of, uh, psychological and uh, you know uh, uh, learning reasoning uh, 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 ways and also there's understanding of the brand so this is a much more mechanical way is to look at whether the brand is like machines constructed by uh, a number of uh, uh, sort of small parts uh, there's a one there's one element of truth is is uh, that the brand it does look like that is a composition of billions of uh, neurons and the uh, interact together, basically generate some of the mechanisms we can remember, we can we can learn, and we can perceive. But of course, that's I mean, brain is more than that. There is a still lots of work needs to be done. Computer science is alongside with AI, and the logic is trying to use AI to understand the logic, using the logic as a way to build the AI system. Philosophy is another one. Is uh, is uh, there's a long debate about uh, uh, AI. You know where AI will uh, become human or overcome human or kill human. There's a you know the scientific sci-fi movie and the natural language is another one is important uh, aspect. So this is actually something I did um, the, the, with the, some of my colleague student did uh, that was um, almost 20 years ago. Is basically trying to build a human brand. Right? If you look at that, is like a brand, right? They have something called the knowledge base, which is our brand, which is like. A, you know, what do we learn? You are stored in your brain. And there's an inference, which is actually the reasoning, the way we reason, you know, if this condition, then what, and then the you know, consequence is what. So we actually store those information into our brains. And then you have this dealing with the input and dealing with output. And then you look at whatever output as and compare to the, uh, to the, to, to the actually what expected. If there's a difference, then you adjust the knowledge. So you can see that that's actually the way we human we do. So those actually the early sort of AI. The, this is much more on knowledge based. Most very popular in the 1950s, um, uh, 70s. Uh, 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 that's the one of the golden period of AI. Is uh, this other thing have become very very popular? So uh, we use that to actually solve some of the problem uh, uh, a while ago, which was uh, proved to be very effective. So this is a uh, one of the problem system we designed. So, so I used to work in the Central Queensland University, as you know, that uh, in the area of Hampton, you know, the, that's it's called the uh, capital of cattle, capital of Australia. So one of the challenge uh, when we are talking to the Department of Crime Industry was this particular weight called the uh, uh, pathenium, you know, this uh, grow aggressively. So one of the problem is uh, one, it's, uh, you know, uh, grow aggressively in the, uh, in the, in the farm, and the cattle eat it, got the stomach upset. Of course, they, they eat less and they won't grow fast. So this is a big challenge uh, in terms of production. So what do we, uh, so what the, at the time, which is uh, late 90s, uh, at the time, the process was you would have a few human experts, the department, and when the farmer have some questions to see what he can do with their land, and they go in there from their experience, advising them to do. But the problem is, as any other university, any other organization, just like what do we have? They have financial pressure. So when those people retired, they, you won't be able to keep their knowledge. So what do we have to do? Is we were helping them. Uh, we have this uh, one of the ARC linkage, early ARC linkage program, basically helping them to build this human brand, to record their knowledge. And we want to do more. We want to actually take the advantage of weather uh, information and also uh, take advantage of uh, soil dynamics and to help to build the system. So basically, what do you do? You have four options, right? If the 
your, your land is infected by weeds, you either uh, move the cattle away or you just, uh, you know, process, you know, you know, the soil, uh, recondition your soil, or you use chemicals or you use the biological uh, ways to introduce new insects. We all know none of them, none of them are perfect. Uh, you know, they all have a pro and a cons. The question is to, to balance. So what we did is we used that uh, artificial brain, you know, the re I would say artificial reasoning brain. I mean, I won't say completely brain. It's build this kind of a software system, right? To be able to record the knowledge, integrate all this information together eventually. So this is eventually the product. The product, the product that we had is basically is, is advisory system. You have the farmer coming here and look at the, uh, then we actually have satellite image here. So we can zoom in in the farm and the farmer come here and look and then play around with it, right? Say if I have this, my soil, my condition is this. If I choose this method, what is the consequence? If I don't do anything, what is the consequence? So this system is basically helping them, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 sort of make decisions. But one of the problem you can uh, sort of uh, imagine is this is a beautiful system, but building this system is so expensive. And we know that uh, those concepts, uh, the, the cognitive type of terms changing over time. So it's very expensive to maintain this type of system. So that's why uh, you know, over the since 1980s, uh, uh, the golden period of AI, uh, this area hasn't progressed fast, partly because of this kind of menu uh, cost of developing system. I will talk to you later on why machine learning coming here to actually help solve the problem. So, so briefly, uh, this is the, uh, a very quick uh, history of AI is that uh, I actually told the course uh, late 90s, 90s. I remember every time at my end of my course, I always say this over process at the time, right? Uh, the, the pretty negative. The, the, the way is uh, that uh, AI, the term of AI at that time uh, is a bad term. Bad term in the way is there was so much promises, so many promises. For example, uh, the early expectation of automatic and natural language translation never occurred, you know, never happened. By the, by the end of 2000. The prediction of this kind of a guru in AI, uh, Herbert Simon said the machine would be a world chess champion within 10 years, never occurred. So people disappointed. So I remember even I applied for ARC grant, avoid using AI, I using intelligent systems because I worry about if I use the AI, people say, oh, well, that's just, a, you know, it's, it's just a, a failed attempt. But of course, we never realized, nobody realized that uh, in the 21st century, suddenly these days AI become password. Every when you apply for grant, you probably have to, have to mention AI. So what happened? Yeah. So one of the key things happened is that this kind of a competition of power. Yeah. I mean, that's a, uh, it improved a lot of the way how do you, how do we calculate? Uh, is that that's actually, we have the old motors. The reason we failed because we just did not have that fast machine to do the co uh, computations. We couldn't get the solution. Now it is possible. And another thing is to capture the public imagination is this kind of a human versus machines. And you have this kind of alpha goal is actually beat the human player, you know, the top human player. The goal I, mean, I used to play when I was young was very, very difficult. You know, it's very, very, there's so many possibilities. But the machine is doing so well, you know, they learn so fast, they can breathe. So, so that's actually bring a, a future, a uh, new a, a, a sort of uh, coming back again. So if I look at the, what happened in the AI, so this is actually my estimation and my sort of uh, view is actually uh, agreed with many other have similar views is, is actually, if you look at all these areas, I think machine learning is the one uh, 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 sort of developed so fast, the most successful, actually got all the name all the sort of fame for AI. But as we say, as we know that AI contain many components, they're far away from actually, uh, you know, uh, sort of developed to the stage that we, we can consider them to be very, very useful. So one of the challenge we have is, uh, this is a, a depends how do you see that, you know, if you look at the uh, philosoph philosophical aspects, AI was meant to be a simulator of humans, but then you got a philosophical problem. Are humans able to use brand to recognize the brand itself? So that is philosophical problem. 
Computational problem is, is another issue. You know, we saw, oh, geez, with now these days, today's computer Amer are very far. But just remember, Einstein said that nothing will travel faster than speed of light. And all computers rely on electron, you know, traveling through the uh, uh, media. So electron, the speed of electron is already a fraction of the, of the high, uh, you know, the, the speed of light. What that means is that in not too far future, all computer, the speed of computer will saturate. You cannot improve any further because we use the physical limitations, right? So this is a, a challenge. But of course, we now look at the uh, uh, disruptive technology, which is called a quantum computer, which promised to be that way. But of course, uh, how do you uh, uh, implement it? Steer far away. So there's actually the challenge. You know, the computer we have to be not just the uh, uh, we cannot create the, uh, in the computer cannot be faster and faster. There's always limitations. But so we have to have a different way of dealing with the thing. Uh, another thing is human brain is a steer black box, means so we still don't understand. And then the, whatever AI is doing work will be black box as well. So uh, for AI to be really like human, there's a steer far away uh, from from. What so the question is, uh, yes, we, you know, AI, we know AI is still far away, but what are we going to do? We still have this large scale uh, complex problem to deal with. So the trick is then, what are you going to do? You have to look at the alternative, right? Look at the how, found a different way of dealing with complexity. So one of the idea which has been uh, sort of uh, advocated uh, in recent time by some of the, uh, you know, Futures, I would say, is that you usually call this complexity. So simplicity is basically a simple solution for complex problem. But so, but this is not. You cannot just interpret in a very sort of a, a, a sort of a narrow way. Is that uh, simple solution are not actually simple at all? Simplification is not just a simple truncation. It is the. Uh, it is require we choose to refuse, connect, imagine in order to act in the best possible manner. So uh, when we say simple means we already understand what that mean and what the consequence of that. So this is actually a, a way uh, uh, for the future if you want to solve it, it is a very large uh, scale problem. So one of the examples I always use of uh, apologies to social scientists, uh, for scientists and engineering, we all learn from undergraduate, from the first year undergraduate, this Taylor expansion. So Taylor expansion is the way, I reckon is the way that uh, show beautifully the elegant way of express the complexity and the simplicity or sim and the, you know, simplicity. So what it says is, it says for any complex uh, functions, you can always express that function into the series. The series has, for example, the first item and the second item is the first order approximation Third item is the second optimum optimization. So it depends on what you need. If you don't need a very accurate solution, you can use the first order approximation. You can sol get solution very, very quickly. If you're very fussy about accuracy, then you take a bit more term. So they give you the balance of the real, the actual uh, term, actual functions and approximation. So this is actually some of the beautiful thing we should have when we're de dealing with complex. Another thing is that, uh, when we say a, a complex system, but if what you want to know has nothing to do with such a complexity, so the things may come pretty easy, right? So if you look at it on the left, on the, on the right, um, that's all very complex. The left is a complex biological system, and on the right is a very complex lungs. But if you want just to ask me a simple term, say what, uh, they have something in common. Uh, what one of the key things? Arterial is fractal, right? So, so the trace is known to be a natural fractal. So fractal is have these self similarities. If you, you know, look into any small part of the tree, you will see the resembling of the whole thing. So, if you want to know that, you don't worry about the old rest of complexity. You know, the the environment. So you don't care. So it depends on what you want to know, right? So this is one example. So another example, this is another interesting example is uh, this kind of relationship, right? If you think about the world, we have, let's say 60, I think we have 60 or 7 billion people around. If you think about relations, it becomes very complex, right? It's kind of unimaginable, but there's a theory 
it, it's called the small world uh, as a network is uh, uh, the, the relations network is basically small world. What happened is that uh, we have six degree of separation. Uh, theory says that if you pick up anybody, two person in the world, on average in no more than six connections, you get to the person. You know, that's why we call small world. You always, oh, oh, I know this person, you know that, but eventually we connect it. It's so often. So if you understand the relationship, it's actually relatively simple, right? Forget about the six billion. How many people? But if you look at it, you know, between them, it's pretty straightforward, pretty simple. So another thing is that uh, this is what we call a, a power system, a power network, and almost all the power supply, uh, this kind of a generation uh, uh, power system is like that. Is uh, uh, you uh, this system we call the scale free network. So regardless of the size, doesn't really matter its size. There are always a fewer nodes have more, more connections. Uh, than other and, and the rest have less. So if you understand these properties and you you want to attack it some of the problems, you might just attack those a few nodes. And if you understand that those, those kind of uh, uh, the rest of those the negl uh, neglecting them wouldn't, wouldn't cause you too much trouble, then then you you'll be okay, right? It's just like election. Election is you can't. You know, you can one way you can try to uh, spend lots of money to approach everybody, but you don't have to, right? If you know a couple of key people have a huge followings, if they promote for you, it's become much more efficient. But if you don't ask 99% people to vote for you, you only not, uh, ask for 50% 50 plus one people vote for you, it's much easier, right? To deal with a few things. So that's actually the, the balance between the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, sim simplified solution. And uh, uh, you know the non-simple so If you understand the relation and all demand it are not that rigid, then you can always uh, take a, take a, some simple, uh, uh, easier way uh, to solve it. So here is one of the example uh, uh, we uh, we done uh, in recent years. So this is actually Austrac. Somebody you probably know is the uh, so financial information agencies uh, dealing with uh, you know detecting. Uh, money laundry networks. You know some of the uh, work they have done is recent with PAC. Uh, is one of the typical examples they did. Um, so what do we, uh, we we uh, uh, we we collaborate with them uh, uh, with computer science uh, professor Chen Zhang. We collaborate with Austrac. He's basically developed this kind of system to uh, 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 fund the money laundry network. So actually the concept is pretty pretty simple, right? The the the, the problem they had is they have uh, millions of uh, transactions every day. And they uh, believe that uh, you know the, the, there there would be a money laundry, laundry network in those undetected. So for detected for the if somebody we know that some criminals and through the, some criminals dealings you found a net that's easy that's actually the daily job they do. What they want to know is that uh, those unknown. So what we did is uh, it's actually if you look, look at the human intelligence basically what we want to understand is we understand the patterns. Of typical money laundry networks, right? If we define the patterns, found the whatever mathematical ways or computational ways to define the indicators, KPIs, we have a, a number of KPIs defined. And then if they give you uh, a high, very high likelihood to pinpoint some of the net, you do it. So after you define it, you let the computer do the search. You leave them to run. That's the, the best uh, they can do. That's, you know, that they do the best is eventually. Uh, you, we can shrink a millions of our possibility into a couple hundred or couple thousand so that human expert can look into that and found it. So this is actually principle is quite quite simple, right? But if you look at the impact, it was quite large. It's actually uh, it was in the new science reported the new scientist uh, quite uh, have quite a good uh, result. But the problem of those projects is after the, you're finished and they took your student, took your uh, all the program and they never say anything. So the only thing you know how how uh, they are successful is whether if, if they are more successful in detecting uh, uh, money laundry network and reporting in the media. So this is another. So another thing is that uh, this is actually the, another point of uh, dealing with uh, complexity. You know, the brand, of course, is good, it's a very complicated dealing, but it doesn't mean that you have to have high intelligence to do sophisticated things. Here is our example. Just look at fish. Right? Fish doesn't have much brain, you know. You know whether you know, they have a feeling is still questionable. But 
And the fish, by simple interaction between just the neighboring fish, they form beautiful patterns, right? So if I only want to form these particular patterns, I understand how they uh, shall I call it the collective intelligence, how they collaborated uh, to form this form. Then I can solve the problem. Right? So this is one example. So another example is the age is the cooperative intelligence. Similar thing is when you have so many individual components, how do you uh, uh, make them collaborate to to perform very sophisticated tasks? So if you look at ants, ants live in a very complex social colony. Even so, they are very simple. You know, the the brain small. Um, the with those kind of social colonies, with the rules, the performance and they can form very complex patterns. So, the, so this actually tells us the lesson, if we look at nature, if we want particular things to be done, we might just uh, borrow this kind of collective intelligence, how they interact. You basically set up a small uh, colony or small society, and you just set a rule, law and order, just like our human societies, and you penalize anybody who do not follow the rule, you, uh, 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 you uh, sort of uh, uh, support, of give bonus uh, uh, for those who uh, you know follow the rules, and society will move. So the, the intelligent agents like us, you know, we will respond to that uh, demand. So that's actually the, uh, one of the particular way to dealing with this complex system. So I just show you some of the example we did uh, uh, in recent years. Uh, uh, we are still doing that. Is uh, so if you think about this uh, 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 microgrid, microgrid is basically small uh, gener power generation system. For example, in uh, uh, remote uh, uh, areas, uh, they generate energy, but sometimes they do connect it with other microgrid, they form these type of clusters. If you think about each of them are individuals, consider, consider them having intelligence. What we should do is the, the principle is pretty simple. You set up this community of this group of uh, multi microgrid, you set up social expectations, right? What do you want to achieve? Cheaper energy, efficient, non interruptive and the cost effective, and you develop the social rules, let them react to each other. So eventually the system can perform as you as you like. So that's actually one of the things we, we, we did. But we did a bit of simulation and also with the industry uh, sort of settings that actually you can do that. So actually some of the paper we, we wrote is uh, sort of being highly cited. Partly is I think that's the first time we introduced this kind of uh, uh, freedom, uh, give the uh, self uh, freedom to those uh, microgrid and design how to they talk to each other. The current uh, actually the uh, the way we're dealing with this type of system is uh, basically top down. You design the rules. Uh, I call it socialist. You design a rule, ask them to follow, and you achieve it. But uh, in the future, this needs to be more like that. Another thing we did using the same idea is uh, dealing with the trading. Uh, we all know that uh, we if we want to. Uh, uh, Create the deal. We talk to our supplier, you know, AG, AGF or Origin. But what we believe is that you can deal with your neighbor directly or anybody in the network without any of them. So it's the same thing. You set the community, you set the law and order uh, interaction, the way how they interact. The system will just automatically deal with it, and you put your preference, uh, uh, and then the the system itself can respond to that and interact with others eventually. Uh, deal with it without any intervention or uh, from the central uh, regulators. There's no need. So uh, the, the concept can be applied. And if you show the data we have here, this is the data is basically we build this kind of peer to peer trading mechanism, have this kind of agent talk to each other. Eventually uh, you, you, you deal with the system like when the, uh, the grid, the electricity is cheap and I store it in my battery. And when it's expensive, I sell it or are particularly buy some energy from green uh, sources, green energy sources, renewables uh, or not. So I, th I think that this whole idea uh, can be applicable to, to very easily. Uh, another example is this example. This is, a, I mean, dealing with complex net. If we have thousands, tens of thousands, millions of nodes together, I mean, let's say, let's say human uh, sort of uh, community, how can you control it, right? So, so you have to look at the nature. So one of the inspiration and uh, motivation we, we, we found is that uh, it's, it's quite long, is that uh, uh, in this uh, honeybee uh, hives, very few individuals, about 5% of them, 
can gather the group to a new nest site. So what that means is I don't care about how many uh, 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 you know, bees there, as long as I identify those 5% and I control them, and they will control the rest of them. And the question, of course, is how to find uh, those kind of critical uh, bees. You know, that's become the sort of a, a, a research, a mathematical uh, research, a computational research. So in recent time, we've been using uh, the developing algorithm with uh, my colleagues, uh, you know, uh, you know, like in RMIT, uh, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Amadi Jalil, you know, uh, Lasan and uh, Peter Sokolovsky and many others to develop the, those kind of uh, algorithms to find the best driver nodes. Uh, so we achieve the goal uh, with minimum uh, sort of uh, effort. So this work is uh, continuing. So I think uh, uh, I just have a, a maybe a, a couple of minutes concluding before we finish and we, 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 we uh, answer some question. But is that uh, what I'm trying to say is that uh, uh, cyber physical system or let's put a cyber physical social system are the future, right? The future is about the machines interaction with humans, right? And machines. Uh, this, uh, you know, they interact with uh, societies and then they interact uh, and uh, collaborate uh, together to achieve economic, social and environment goals. So, but of course, having that system increase the huge uh, complexity, apart from uh, the discipline wise, we need to talk to each other, you know, understand where there's, uh, uh, we need to find a way to de deal with the complexity in size and, and, and uh, in, uh, in uh, sort of uh, different uh, properties. So certainly, as I said before, AI is still far away from uh, uh, giving us actually the tool completely solving all these problems. So we have to look at elsewhere. So we need to look at the nature and the found those kind of ingenious, easy way to solve the problem. Because uh, if the problem does not require a big data, having big data means nothing. Big data means nothing. So it uh, just depends on the problem. So basically that requires us is look at the problem we study, understand it very well, and just use enough information and just to give enough solution what it required you. Right? So this is one. The second point I, try, I would like to make is that uh, certainly all what we discussed is forming these kind of new methodologies. So that certainly there is a currently a movement around the world is looking at uh, this kind of simplexity to deal with in particular spatial temporal uh, aspects of, the, uh, of, the, of this problem in a, in a, in a very timely uh, fashion. The next point I want to make is that uh, there's need a balance between optimality, timeliness, and complexity. Optimal is good, optimal solution, but you, uh, we would, uh, if anybody study the operation research, would know that optimal solution can only be found in the in, in, in the place where the infeasible and feasible solution when they uh, collide. Right. What that means is that optimal solution is never robust. It means anything small changes, the whole solution collapsed. So the the, the there is a uh, kind of uh, in the industry, there's kind of a movement that is going towards a much more robust solution means that even some of the initial conditions slightly change, the solution, the structure solution does not change. Another thing is the timeless. You cannot looking for optimality without considering time. In industry system, time is, is very critical. You've got to respond by that time. If you don't, useless, I mean, all solution useless. So then you will need to understand the optimality and complexity and understand that how much we have to sacrifice and to achieve our goal, so, which I think is very important. So I believe that in the future, uh, there will be new generation of theories and methodology for subophysical system and the subophysical social system are emerging. And I think RMIT is well placed uh, in here. We have uh, quite a few uh, ECPs, is a look at the interdisciplinary research, and hopefully uh, we will do something, uh, something great in that area. This is a very exciting, area and uh, I think I believe that it is we have exciting time ahead. So I think I just uh, uh, stop here. I would like to thank to all my uh, associate uh, colleagues, uh, students uh, to uh, fulfill the work uh, we were reported here. So i open for questions and answers. Thank you very much. So collective clap here. Thank you very much. Uh, Jing, that was very, very fascinating. Um, we have a number of questions in the um, in the chat, so yeah. perhaps I can go over to that. And um, apart from being very congratulatory and thanking you, uh, one of the questions is about um, 
uh, AI based on uh, on systems are modelled via past experience, just like human experiences. Will you agree that the lack of popularity of this system is due to the lack of any mathematical valid? Uh, I, I would. This is very, very interesting question. Very hard to to answer. The mathematical proof is one way, but the problem of the mathematical proof is that uh, when the situation uh, situation become very complex, it's very hard to prove. You know, I mean, it's very hard to prove. Uh, I'm not sure how to answer the question, but. Uh, uh, I think that one of the reason uh, of a, a, AI, and I mean, there's a two stream. And if you look at the mathematical approach, you look at the rigorousness of the proof, the completeness of the proof. But there's another way. If you look at the computer science, you look at the empirical study, you use the cases to show that uh, you, in most of the cases it works and, until some sort of a counter example. So I think there's a, I mean, there's a, a discipline uh, difference in dealing with the uh, 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 the issue, but I think the AI, uh, as I mentioned, the reason of AI uh, become a bit of problem was was because uh, when you're too much focus on knowledge based system, and when we don't understand our brain too well, then the, there there will be limitations. So I think the future we probably have to find different way to uh, to, uh, to deal with the problem. Okay. Um. Now I've got a question here about. Uh, traditionally, engineers perform perform analysis and design based on mathematical models in the form of state space. Do you think this approach is applicable to CPS? Yeah, that's I think that we have to move away from the state space. You know, that's always my point is. Uh, I think the engineering uh, uh, science uh, uh, developed in the way is become so mathematical, much uh, but less than intuitive. Just imagine in all the time when in 1950s, when people study uh, the power system, they use the flow coming through in the door and out of door. So the difference to judge system is stable or not. But if you look at that approach, you ignore the dimensions. But if you go to the other way around, look at dimension, you look at these microscopic details, you forgot the whole picture. But I think we are moving away. I think there will be in the future, there will be middle ways. You, you look at this kind of physical, uh, a flow point of view, uh, ignore the dimensions, but then when you're dealing with the uh, require uh, the details of the of the machines to uh, to study, so then you go into the models. So I think in the future there will be a mixed uh, model of dealing with uh, this problem. Okay, there's a question here about you know replacing people, and I'd like to come to that as a social scientist, probably the, one of the few on online. Um, but one here question for data analysis, for example, uh, on the results from engineering experiments. Um, do you think deep learning for CD, CFD simulation statistical samplings? Do you think deep learning can replace replace humans to perform the post analysis? Uh, this is actually uh, always, uh, let, let me put my view on this machine learning. I say the machine learning is not too new in the way. So remember when we study our mathematics, mathematical modeling, you know, we start curve fitting, right? You have millions of data, you could have hundreds of thousands of data. You use a simple curve with couple of parameters variable. You simulate very well. So as an engineer, we are doing the com uh, data compression machine learning all the time, but we don't talk. But the, the problem we had, we don't deal with that large size. So I think there's no, uh, if we know the model, model is, uh, the, I interpret the mathematical model, is data compression model, is understand the data, coming from the data, understand it, and formulate it in the way, very precisely describe the function with minimum, sort of, uh, 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 it's just a, a, a require the uh, key information. So I don't see the difference between mathematical modeling and machine learning. Machine learning may be coming to a, a too big on the data side and focusing on data. But in fact, I mean, they sort of, uh, you know, I would say intervened, you know, it's it's a, it's a, I think uh, uh, if we know uh, machine learning, if we don't know the data, we can use machine learning, right? Machine learning tell, tell us the, uh, the data property. If we know the data, that we don't need the machine learning. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just here's a big question about where we're going with this field. 
What do you think is the future big thing in cyber physical systems? Uh, a couple of things. Uh, depends on what type of cyber physical systems. Uh, if you look at this dynamics type of cyber physical, there's a lot of fundamental challenges. For example, I, I mentioned about communication uh, foundation of the platform, you know, the language platform. There's a lot of challenges. Communication, rely, you know, there are lots of challenges as well. Uh, but in terms of big picture, I, I see it moving towards much more cyber physical social system. Uh, is that how do we interact? To understand the, the how the social system evolves, but I actually do, did a bit of reading of social system. My conclusion was actually there was not much difference because when you look at the social science, they, they look at the evidence and look at the modeling, they look at the reasoning and they reach the conclusion. I mean, there's a, I mean, just the language is slightly different. Uh, so there is a some 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 way. The question we have is how the how those two sides of this research can interact to make it, let's say, the cyber physical system much more efficient, perform better, and for, for, for social system understand better cyber physical system, so the social system development will consider that a fact, so the both of them can develop together. So that, that's what I see is a big future. Big discussion going on about complex systems modeling uh, in in social science, I and mean, it's a really huge thing. So, but the devil's in the detail. Might I yes. find it's easier yes. to say than it is to do. Um, so, where do you where do the business and regulatory environments and community sentiments fit into the virtual and physical environments of CPSS? Well, uh, at the present time, it depends on which level, right? Let's say if you look at this kind of energy, uh, let's say the uh, I call it the any. Uh, uh, sort of uh, energy dispatch, uh, economic dispatch. Ex ex economic dispatch is basically a planning process which locate, let's say, because you have so many generators, you lo locate the task or workload to different part and ask them to produce. So those kind of social dimensions, economic dimension coming on top of that, it's a become constraint. Uh, is, uh, that's one of the way uh, is coming from the top down from the social economic constraints. And then you using and uh, this kind of optimization to consider those constraints and provide those kind of uh, uh, workload location to the others. On the other other hand, is I think there's a, it's both ways. On the other hand, I think those kind of social economic modeling uh, constraints. Uh, when people formulate that, they have to consider the char characteristics of the physical system because some of the things physical system just cannot do. So I think the both and uh, understanding uh, need, uh, we need to have this kind of both understanding. So you would have a much more effective social economic uh, uh, goals and to achieve. Why uh, you know that physics uh, system can respond to it. I'm 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 conscious that the time has almost run out, and I just wanted to add in a question, building on that last question, because. One thing that you didn't really consider is ethics, and I think there's a lot of discussion at the moment around AI. You didn't in the philosophy section. You didn't as a limitation of AI. You didn't really consider that. And I just wonder, just building on this last um, question that came about community sentiments and how that fit into all of this. Can you just comment on you know the ethical dimensions of of using these? Uh, approaches and if the, if you can see any and and then what the solution is to bringing that to you know, uh, trying to solve yeah. those things. Uh, this is actually a good. Uh, this is probably my uh, oversight of mine. Is uh, I mean I, I struggle between uh, you know uh, ex ex explain something to non uh, scientific engineers and uh, so it's trying to find a way to explain. Certainly this it is. I think this problem would be the similar. To the problem of uh, let's say uh, you know you let's say you studied nuclear, the technology can generate uh, you know the uh, you know this uh, nuclear power, but the problem is the user how to use it. The, 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 you know the engineers uh, the, the how to use it. They use it for peaceful purpose, for the benefit of society, or use it for wars. So I think they come down to the another dimension is that uh, uh, the people. Uh, you know, study AI and use AI to create the things, whether that's uh, the purpose is ethical or not. So I'm not sure I'll answer your question, but I just thought that's a, if I compare that way, is uh, eventually a come down to the individuals. 
uh, practitioners, uh, the ethical standard, you know, the obligations to, uh, you know, to do the work ethically. Yes, I think this could be a very good debate, but I'm conscious that it's time. <laughs> and uh, on behalf of all of us, uh, Jing, thank you so much for a fascinating uh, lecture. It's really been terrific. Thank you to everyone for your participation and to for actively engaging in the questions. Um, I think it's been a terrific session and I'm sure there'd be interest in a follow up, particularly with the social scientists. So yes. <laughs> uh, well done. Thank you so much. And OK, bye, thank everyone. you very much. Thank, thank you. you, everyone. Bye for now. Thank you.